The six members who stood with me and others who I think wanted to stand but weren't quite ready to do it yet, that that didn't happen. That there was a basis for her to move and to bring about charges shortly after she saw the video and that in order to establish trust and for there to be fairness and impartiality that the charges that were brought about only after the release of the video could have been brought about 13 months ago she failed the system of justice and that's why she needs to step down and it's not the only reason there's also a history of the past seven years that she has served in that office of her not being fair and impartial, of not being uh, responsive to ordinary citizens and not believing in restorative justice. As Cook County has moved forward in terms of changing our approach to criminal justice in concrete ways like reducing the Cook County jail population by ceasing to incarcerate people who are charged for small possession of marijuana and other non-violent crimes or for not being able to produce a bail bond uh, because they have been charged with a crime but have no history of violence and aren't a threat to their community. That is how you move the system of criminal justice forward. It's one of the important components of taking on the incarceration industrial system that we have created in America because we jail more people per capita than any other country on the globe. America can do better. That's why we need criminal justice reform in our country. So I couldn't uh, come here today without addressing those issues and the topic that everyone has been talking about over the past two weeks. But it's also very interesting to me that as more and more reporters begin to do more homework about the circumstances surrounding the video, that it sure looks like it was concealed from the public because of its potential impact on Yes, Chicago politics. Right. People have asked me, well, what do you think would have happened if the video would have been released last December or last January? I responded, I said, it would have had a profound impact. And they said, well, do you think? I said, hold it, hold it. I am one that rarely looks back at what has happened. I do know that the people of Chicago feel that they were denied an opportunity to know and to understand how this mayor functions and the extent to which he will stoop to protect his political hide and the status quo in Chicago. And history has borne that out. In my wildest imagination, did I ever think that a bill would be introduced in Springfield seeking recall of the mayor in the city of Chicago. <laughs> Even people like Representative LaShawn Ford, who by the way did not endorse me in, the, in my, in my uh, mayoral candidacy uh, campaign, uh, has seen enough to move him to say that the people of Chicago have been defrauded and that they ought to have the mechanism by which to say, we take it back. We have buyer's remorse. We were sold a bill of goods, and all of those goods that we bought turned out to be faulty. We want a refund. So we represent more things that that's what Chicago needs, and that's what's good for Illinois, so be it. But I want to also just remind us why I ran for mayor in the first place, because that's really what's important here. I ran for mayor so that there could be a clear alternative on the ballot for the people of Chicago in terms of the agenda that we advanced. We said 
There's too much inequality in Chicago. Chicago only works for the benefit of a few. The few control the purse strings of campaigns for the highest office, office, and there's too much money in politics in the Chicago City Council. Chicago needs an alternative. Karen Lewis could not run for the office. She asked me to do it. I decided to do it because, not because I wanted personal recognition and because it was a, an ambition that I had held. I did it because it needed to be done. Because Chicago needed to know that an alternative agenda, a different vision of the future of the Chicago that says we must have an equity agenda that drives how this administration, a different administration, will work for Chicago and the one that will put the neighborhoods first. One that will invest in the most disinvested communities in the city of Chicago, especially those that experience an unemployment rate of about 25%. Invest in the neighborhoods that have the highest levels of violence and gun violence in the city of Chicago. Keep public education public and come to terms with the funding crisis that we have in Illinois. Those were some of the key tenets of my candidacy for mayor. I wanted to do that and we did it. We had three weeks to prepare for that battle. I filed more nominating petitions because of people like you who took it upon yourself to say this is a progressive people's candidate and we're going to put him on the ballot. We're going to engage in a great battle, ordinary people against the 1% and look at what we did. I was down in Mexico over the past three days, met with some immigration activists and labor leaders while I was down there, and all they wanted to talk about was the Chicago mayoral election. And they wanted to know, is there going to be a special election soon for the mayoralty? I said, I don't know. I don't have a crystal ball, but I tell you, the citizens of Chicago uh, would like to change where the direction that the city is headed in and we have nothing to be ashamed about in terms of the campaign that we launched. And let me tell you a few things that were achieved along the way. One, we increased through the activism of groups and especially the Fight for 15 campaign. We forced the mayor to increase the minimum wage in the city of Chicago. It's not the $15 an hour that you and I would like a living wage for everyone, but it is a step forward. Why did it happen? Because the fight for 15 rooted in many Chicago neighborhoods, supported by many labor unions in the city of Chicago, made the case plain and simple and forced the mayor to push the ordinance in the city council. So while by 2019 it isn't $15 an hour, we will continue to fight for increasing the minimum wage. For public education is another very critical issue in the city of Chicago. As you know, I came out in support of an elected reform school board. The mayor is opposed to the elected school board. But what did he do? Recognizing that his school board had no credibility, was under federal investigation. A week after the election, talk about uh, hiding things, sweeping things under the rug. The Justice Department announced that there was a federal investigation of Chicago public schools. Shortly thereafter, they indicted the school superintendent. Within a week, the school superintendent pled guilty, as did others. Isn't it a coincidence that we learned about the investigation one week after the runoff in the city of Chicago? But more importantly, the movement for an elected school board in the city of Chicago is moving forward. And I'm happy to say that there are now over 50 sponsors, state representatives, who have signed on to the bill. And the prospects for the bill being called seem to be getting better by the day. Chicago will have an elected school board like the rest of the state of Illinois. a lot about how the city center is beautiful, it is shiny, it exemplifies tremendous prosperity.
But truth be told, that there is little of that to be seen in neighborhoods throughout the city of Chicago. One of the hotly debated issues that I feel good about and vindicated after the election is the fact that shortly within the last four months, the mayor has announced that seven tax increment financing districts will be closed, and I assure you there will be more to come because the public sentiment is that those are property tax revenues that ought to be used in disinvested areas and community activists from neighborhoods throughout the city of Chicago will continue to push for real tax increment financing reform in the city of Chicago. We don't just need seven, we need more. And we need for those revenues to be used to create jobs in areas that have suffered the most. I just want to say a couple of things about Cook County government. As I began my second term uh, earlier this year, I'm very proud of the fact that at Cook County Jail, as part of the president's initiative when first sworn into office, was to reduce the number of people, non-violent detainees, at Cook County Jail. And what do we have to show for it? Within the last two years, when she brought the stakeholders together, when sometimes she almost embarrassed some of the stakeholders in the criminal justice system to moving forward in a good direction, we have reduced the Cook County jail population, which is in my district, by the way, by over 2,000 people, and we will continue to move forward to save taxpayers money, but then to take the savings of shrinking the jail population and investing them in other good things in Cook County, like restorative justice, like violence prevention, like youth development programs, and mental health treatment of people who wind up at Cook County Hospital because the state and the city have closed down mental health clinics. That is part of a good people's agenda in Chicago and Cook County. We have stabilized the health system in Cook County. We're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination, but it's been stabilized. Because of the expansion of the Affordable Care Act and the Medicaid expansion in the state of Illinois, we have over 175,000 people in Cook County who today have health insurance. Additionally, the mission of the health system, yeah, let's clap for that, that's a good thing. Yeah. 10,000 in my district alone, excluding Cook County, where people who have been in detention because of a, of a progressive thrust and a progressive administration, when they were in jail, were qualified for the county care program, which is an extension of the Affordable Care Act. So that is what a different set of priorities looks like in a progressive county government. The state budget, as you know, we're facing an unprecedented crisis in the state of Illinois that is hurting the most vulnerable in Illinois, and we've now been without a state budget since July 1st. Why? Because we have a 1% governor in Springfield. Because he has an anti-union, anti-worker, anti-poor people, anti-education agenda that he wants to prove before he negotiates a state budget. We're urging our state legislators not to capitulate to the demands of this billionaire who is the first in Illinois. It is essential that the state take its responsibility seriously respond to the needs of ordinary Illinoisans, working people, people who need the social, the social safety net that the state is responsible for providing, and we continue to fight by saying that there should not be, Illinois should not become a right to work state, Illinois should not engage in union busting, and Illinois should pay all of its unionized workers and all workers a living wage. That's the way forward for Illinois. And to close, the 2016 election is providing us with a great opportunity one that many of us didn't see even a year ago. The
presidential contest between Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders, who's my candidate, by the way. And now to Iowa and stuff in other places for him. I endorsed Bernie Sanders because I agree that the most critical issue in America today is inequality and the concentration of wealth and the erosion of the quality of life of working people and the poor across this country. So what is the vision of Bernie Sanders? What is Bernie Sanders offering the people of our country? Bernie Sanders is clear. Bernie Sanders understands that the only way out of the present crisis and the race to the bottom is by engaging in a democratic political revolution in America. One that removes money out of politics so that the millionaires and the billionaires who have hijacked our government in Washington, D.C., in state legislature after state legislature, in cities, as we have experienced and witnessed firsthand in Chicago by amassing millions of dollars to politicians who will drive a corporate privatizing agenda of austerity while impoverishing the great numbers of people who live in cities and metro areas of our country. The only way that things will change is by electing someone like Bernie Sanders who understands that big money in politics works against ordinary people, works against unionized people, works against minorities. We need a political revolution and Bernie Sanders offers that vision and that hope for America. I'm also supporting Bernie Sanders because Bernie understands that in order for us to address the unemployment rate in cities and metro areas across the country and to put ordinary people back to work who have been a part of the result of deindustrialization and privatization is by legislating a real massive jobs program to rebuild America's decaying infrastructure in cities and highways and bridges all over this country. It's the only way to, at a significant scale, put people back to work, stimulate the economy, and provide real prosperity to everyone in America. That's why I'm supporting Bernie Sanders. Yeah. And if you're not supporting Bernie Sanders, that's fine. Uh, we'll see you at the conventions next year. But uh, this is an exciting moment in American politics, and uh, we move forward. I'm also supporting Bernie Sanders because he has shown and demonstrated to be a person who listens. I've had the opportunity to call Bernie and say, Bernie, I think you need to tweak your immigration proposal. And he said, what do you mean? And I said, give me a half hour and we'll get you some experts. And uh, we found him to be a good listener, to be responsive. And he laid out an immigration proposal two weeks ago that is the most specific, the most forward-looking, that recognizes the world that we live in, the interdependency between Mexico and Central America and South America's economy, the Canadian economy, and it recognizes that we must have global approaches to improving the livelihood and the well-being of people regardless of what country they live in. The economy works like that, capital works like that, labor must have the same possibilities and people must learn to engage across borders as transnational actors. Bernie Sanders understands how we need to move forward. Bernie Sanders rejects xenophobic rhetoric, the type espoused by people like Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, and even other members of the other party who are seeking to become our president. It is shameful that people like Trump would stoop to scapegoating immigrants, particularly Mexican immigrants, and now going after the Muslims in our country and denigrating them in the way that they have. We must reject hateful rhetoric and say someone like that is not 
someone fit to hold the office of President of the United States of America. So friends, I thank you for the opportunity to share a few thoughts with you about where things are uh, in Cook County, the state of Illinois, and of course, with respect to our country. I'm going to be working very, very hard over the next few months and leading through next summer as we go to the nominating convention uh, in Philadelphia, and you know where I stand. I have shared that with you, not because I think you need a partisan argument about who to support. You know how to add, you know how to subtract, you know when someone's trying to pick your pocket. We've had our pockets picked long enough. We need real justice in this country. We need to make America work for everyone, and the only way that that will happen is when we engage in real transformative politics. I thank you for all of your activism on so many different fronts, your support of workers, your support of unions over the years, and your support and championing of racial justice, an issue that the entire country is now grappling with. Thank you so much. La lucha continua.